So before we start, um, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners on the land in which we all gather. For um, Louisa and I in Townsville, it's the Wulgura Kaba and Bindle people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, okay, so um, a bit about Tark and, and myself. Oopsie. Right. The a bit about Tark and myself. Um, so Tark is the Tropical Australian Academic Health Centre. Um, the first thing you, I want you to um, eyes to gravitate towards on this slide is the website, right? So on the website, we spend a lot of time making sure that you know about the events that we're putting on. There is a research education calendar um, where you can register events like that. So you don't have to wait for the flyers. You can actually have a look in the months that are coming up, like the August, September, and have a look at what's coming up and you'll be able to register for, for upcoming events there. We are a collaboration uh, across the five HHSs in Northern Queensland. Uh, we also uh, have partnerships um, with the five HHSs, JCU, uh, Quake and NQPHM. So there are eight of us in collaboration here. The research themes that TARC's board has decided to run with um, are really pertinent and important for North Queenslanders and, and the HHS systems that are there and the health, health programs that are operating up here. And they are um, service delivery to regional, rural and remote and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. We are focused on innovative health workforce models, um, part of that to kind of stem that idea about, you know, the fly in, fly outs and hard to recruit um, ideas. Uh, we also work in the very prevalent non-communicable diseases that are in our region and also the infectious diseases that are in our region. But do go have a look at the website. All of this is recorded, by the way, um, so you can at any time just go and pop. So we've got quite a lot of recordings up on the TARC YouTube channel now. You can just come up and pop and, and have a read of those. But do have a look at the website where you will find the recordings um, because that, that's got a lot of resources there. We spend a long time doing that. So my role is the research education lead. Um, my remit is to um, build research capability and um, capacity um, for all of the staff of the members in our organisation. So whatever level that you're looking at, there's different provisions for different levels. So those leaders in research, um, they and I might um, work on, on different things to people who are very new to research, but we work across the spectrum making sure that we offer um, different kind of services and del different deliverables to everybody within those services should they want that. So things like these kind of skills-based sessions, I might help with um, tutoring on some projects and stuff. So I might work with someone to write a protocol. I might help like in the, on the website, we might um, do curated resources, all those kind of things just to make sure that we can build um, capability across, uh, across the patch. All right. So a couple of different bits and pieces for housekeeping for us. Caution, this is interactive, all right? Because it's a skills-based session rather than a webinar, I'm going to make sure that we are interacting and learning together about this, all right? Um, so some of the things you will be asked to participate. Um, so just be ready to speak up uh, when you feel comfortable in doing so. Um, mute your microphones, I guess, if there's any background noise, but there's quite, um, there's not very many of us, so it doesn't, it's okay. Um, feel free to put any questions in the chat. I am notoriously bad, as we've just experienced earlier, of not seeing things in the chat, um, but I will do my best to have a look at now. I can see that chat pops up. I will do my best to have a look in the chat, but you're more than welcome to go, oh, you know, so-and-so's raised stuff in the chat. Um, but also raise your hand if you have any questions. And Claire has already found her thumbs up button. So I'm pretty happy with that. Well done, Claire. Nice thumbs up button. All right. Are there any questions about what we're going to start with today? All right. Okay. So the topic of today is developing a research question. And what I want to know is why do you need to create a focused research question? All right. So predominantly, there's, there's kind of two reasons why you might want to do that. Okay, and the first is that if you have a research question, you want to go and find out the answer to it. Like, you know, if you have a clinical question, someone presents with a problem, um, you might want to go and find out what, what the answer to that problem is so that you can provide them with the best service that you can, the best the health care that needs that they have. So that's one of the reasons. It helps you develop 
a, a particular search strategy and work and search more efficiently for the answers. And if you do searches in PICO and you have a clear research clinical question, people like Louisa in the library are going to be very grateful that you know what it is that you want to find the answer to. Is that fair enough, Louisa? <laughs> Absolutely. You're on mute, but I can lip read a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, so if you have a clear focus question, you'll be able to search for those answers better, right? The other thing to have a clear focus question is that it makes objectives for research much more easy to define, right? It keeps you focused on what it is that you want to know. So two reasons, it helps you find an answer as a clinician, and it helps you understand what your question is as a researcher. So what do we mean by focused and unfocused, right? So a broad question and an unfocused question might be, how do we support solo practitioners or remote settings overnight? Ooh. All right. Now that's a question that's come up, okay? But that's a really broad question, okay? So we don't know. So what does support mean? Who are the practitioners? And exactly what do you mean by remote, right? So we don't know what that means. So a focused question might be, for nurses working in remote clinical service level two facilities, does an after hours telephone support service increase confidence in risk management, right? Now that is a current research project that's happening in Northwest, right? So that's, that's a focused research question. It helps us know what it is we want to understand. Okay. The way you construct these kind of questions is by putting it into a framework called PICO. So let's start with PICO. All right. So P is for population and clinical problem. Okay. So who are the relevant people in relation to the problem that you have in mind? Who are the people and what is the problem? The I in PICO can stand for a couple of different things. It might be an intervention. What do you want to do with someone? It might be an indicator or it might be an index text. So the question relates to what is the in intervention, index test or indicator that you want to find out more about in relation to the problem? Hello, Janine. Nice to see you. And this, this might be, it might be a procedure. Right? You know, what's the best way to do something? It might be a medication. What is the best medication for something to relieve pain? It might be a type of surgery. Is this type of surgery versus this type of surgery better? It might be a comparison of a particular types of diet, FODMAP versus Mediterranean, which one's better for X, right? So they are examples of interventions, right? You might have exposures or indicators. What's an environmental chemical or a hazard, a physical feature? You know, what is something that's happened to someone or it happened in an environment that is an exposure, an, um, an indicator of something? Or if you're looking at a diagnostic test, that would be an index test, right? So if you're looking at that kind of idea, there might be things like um, a blood test or a brain scan, and they're called index tests, right? You've got your P, population, you've got your I, your intervention, index, indicator. Now you've got your C, right? And a C is a comparator. So what are you comparing the I to, all right? Are you comparing it to something, all right? Um, what's the alternative control strategy? What's the alternative exposure? What's the alternative index test to the one that you're interested in, all right? And then the O really easily is with the, with the, what's the outcome? You know, what is it that you want to want change? What is it you want to learn? What is it that you want to understand? Okay, so that's the P code. So I'm going to stop here. Have you got any questions for me? Mark's off. There's only a couple of us. Easy as. I see shakes of hands. I'm surprised. Do you not have a question? All right. We'll be testing. All right, so let's go back to our focus question. 
For nurses working in remote clinical service, level two facilities, does an after hours telephone support service increase confidence in risk management? That was our focused research question. Someone tell me what they think might be the P. Claire, go for it. I did try that two seconds ago and I was like, I feel like the chaser. Did I get it? <laughs> um, I'm thinking it's nurses. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah, I was thinking nurses as well. Mm -hmm. Is it actually nurses working in remote areas, level two facilities um, to narrow it my down? Question. Yeah, use the question to guide you in that. Nurses doing in where? So remember, P is about population and it's about the problem kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're on the right track, Claire. Expand it. Go back. Do it again. So it's nurses in remote clinical service level two facilities working after hours. <laughs> <laughs> we can stick with that. Not quite. <laughs> yep. Nurses working in remote clinical service level two facilities. Right? That's the people that you're interested in. Right? That's your population. Nice work. What's the I? The after hours telephone support service. Next. Hmm. What's the C? What are you comparing it to? <laughs> uh, that there wasn't anything before. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Whatever's there now. Uh -huh. What have they got now? Who knows? And what's the O? Confidence in risk management. Done. All right, we can stop now. We can all go home. You've got 45 mm -hmm. minutes left. Well done. That was it. Good job. Right, so that's your PICO, okay? The other thing that can happen in a PICO and I haven't focused on it for this session at all because it just depends. But there can be a P-I-C-O-T, right? And T stands for time. So it might be for some of your research questions, you might time might be an important thing that you want to know about, right? So you might want to know about something that has... Um, does somebody in uh, does somebody what what is the length of time that somebody's pain might decrease does it decrease on day three does it decrease on day six so in those kind of clinical questions time might be important right usually time we don't necessarily structure in our in our pico but if it is important to your question then you just add the t and it stands for time because you want to know in what kind of time frame does this happen in, right? It doesn't really relate to things like a um, a question where you're running a you're, you're running Sandy might be running a, a social work support group for six months, right? That's not really a T that adds in the P code. So it's not really necessarily about that. But if she wants to know whether or not um, an intervention that she's running works better in four weeks or eight weeks. Then, then that's an important point. You see where time matters sometimes, but not always. And mm, I'll stop there. All right. Let's try to get up. All right. I'm going to give you a minute to read this. Okay, all right. So I'm just going to put in the my pre prepared that work. All right, so I'm going to ask you now to write down what do you think, and I put it in the chat. What is the PICO? 
the population, the intervention, the comparator, or the outcome and the outcome that you're interested in. So write it down. Spend a minute or so writing out the P code. Sandy looks like she's ready. All right. Now, if I, now my problem is I'm going to click to the next slide and I can't remember if I've animated it or not. Oh, wait. Oh, I can't remember. So I might actually give you all the answers really quickly, which will be such a shame. Hmm. We shall see. Are you ready? Who, who wants to tell me what the, they think the P is? A uh, 65-year-old man traversing the Atlantic by air. Hmm. Specific? Yep. Anybody else? I just had a traveling elderly on long flights, <laughs> very broad. <laughs> yep. Maybe it should be over the age of 60. And that kind of, that information really does depend on what you want to know, right? And that's, that becomes down to some clinical expertise, right? So is there any reason, and there might be, that, that you would stipulate age? And you'd probably be a bit broad about that. So you might be over x over 60 or something like that if it matters to the outcome so if people over 60 are more likely to get uh, uh, to have problems in, in those kind of flights then that would be something that i'd put in the population um, but if it can apply to anybody then you don't have to do that but you, you're both both on the money so it's passengers on long-haul flights right because it doesn't matter about whether they're short you actually want to know whether they're long Right. Okay. So what's the I? Elastic stopping stockings, I put. Mm, that's what I was thinking. Yep. Elastic compression stockings. Absolutely. Yep. Comparator? None. Yep. No, not wearing them. Outcome. DVT risk. Increased. Yep. DVT. All right. You got that? So now, oh, now, remember how I showed you the nurse's question and I made it a focus question. All right. I'm going to go backwards and forwards now into this sort of stuff. So I showed you a scenario. You now did a P code. Now, who would like to have a guess how to construct? the focus research question from that going from the clinical scenario to the PICO, now to the focused research question. What would the focused research question look like? Could it be, do passenger, um, exploring whether or whether passengers on long haul flights wearing elastic compression stockings decrease the risk of DVT in comparison to no elastic stockings. That's not good. It makes it so much easier for other people, honest. <laughs> That's the way you do it. Usually I just start at the top and go down. So it's like, in passengers on long haul flights, does wearing elastic compression stockings compared with not increase the risk of DVT? Right. You start at the top and work your way down. Now there are some times you'll come, to, you'll do that, 
and you look at your sentence and go, oh, that's grammatically really awful, right? So you'll change it around and stuff. But that's how you would start. You'd start at the top and you'd work your way down, okay? And then that's what you would take to Louise, your focus research question with your Pico, and then she will help you look at your synonyms and your, how to construct a search. And she would she would rescue you from your next question, which was, what do I do now? <laughs> so that's how you would take it to her to make her life a lot easier. All right. But let's work. Let's work for some more scenarios. All right. So this is Ruth. OK. And Ruth is a 56 year old woman in good health with no chronic health conditions. She has been experiencing pain in her right knee for the last two years and has been diagnosed with right knee osteoarthritis. She takes paracetamol and ibuprofen as needed, but says this does not really help with her pain. All right, so that's Ruth. Let's go through a couple of different scenarios in relation to Ruth. Right, so let's pretend you're Ruth GP. Janine, this is your field. So let's pretend you're Ruth GP. One consultation, Ruth asks about keyhole arthroscopic surgery to reduce the pain she's experiencing. Mm, but she did want your opinion about that. She says that this surgery improved her friend's pain, that um, you're unsure whether arthroscopy for knee osteoarthritis will reduce pain or if exercise is better. All right, spend, some, spend a minute or so writing out the PICO for me. Louise has done, she's had more practice. <laughs> Have you had a go? All right, then. Who wants to tell me what the P might be? Population and problem. I thought this one was an interesting one of um, whether it's adult or middle-aged because she's only 56. Young? Mm. Oh, yes, <laughs> definitely. That's what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With knee pain or osteo knee osteo. Mm. Oh, with yes, okay. Say it again then, Claire. I I missed the bit. Oh, with um, so adults with knee pain, or they had in the brackets the knee osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. So whichever way. Anybody else? Oh, so yeah, it could work. I had over fifty mm -hmm. simply because it, I was just thinking that there's, and it might be other questions, but it um. It might be different for younger people um, and it might be different potentially for women and men um, in that age, I mean, the health considerations. So, but I just started with over 50 with uh, knee pain as a result of osteoarthritis. Okay. Mm -hmm. Janine, have you got something similar or different? Yeah, I had women or people in brackets experiencing knee pain. Um, and a diagnosis of osteoarthritis. But didn't yep. have the age in there, but that's very, very relevant, I think. 
because it could be an age related. So and that's, that's yeah, and that's where I can't be across all medical conditions nor all professions, and I don't know, right? Um, but I would certainly put in um, potent, I would certainly put in. It's probably unlikely younger people get neo A, um, but they might. I don't know. Um, but I might put in women, so it might be different. Mm -hmm. um, but I had women with knee osteoarthritis. So that's the population I wanted. Um, but that's okay. It, it, what it, all of you had the right answer. That's just what I wrote down. So is there an I? What's the I? Do you want me to go backwards? Keyhole, keyhole surgery. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. yeah, I just had the arthroscopy, which is the same, I suppose. Claire, you too? Yeah, same. Okay, welcome, Murdy. Um, yeah, and Louisa? You had the same. Okay. Thanks, uh, Ray. Oh, hello. <laughs> just welcome. Join in. See, see if we can, can keep going. Um, okay, so I had, um, yet yeah, my eye was keyhole arthroscopic surgery. Yep. And again, I don't know if keyhole may, means makes a difference. Um, I'm assuming arthroscopic might be important. Um, that's what I thought was important. Compared with what? Exercise to reduce pain. Compared with exercise, I'd stop you there. Because what's the outcome? Reduce pain. Outcome is pain. What you want is reduced pain. But the outcome is purely pain. Because, you know, because one study might have increased pain, one study might have reduced pain. You're looking for pain. If you were going to do a search, you're looking for pain. Louisa, you are on mute, so I'm going to miss that one. Sorry, no pain and no surgery. The you had no pain and no surgery? Yep. Yep. Well, for the comparator, no surgery <laughs> would be the comparator. Except the doctor wanted to know if exercise was better than... Oh, people. sorry, I didn't... No. There you are, see, I wasn't, I wasn't put watching. That, just, oops, put that down here. Reduced pain or if exercise, or exercise. is better. So that's the only reason... Yes, because yes, if you, you're true. right. If the exercise wasn't there, you just have no surgery, right? Um, but the exercise was there, so I put it in as yep. a comparator. Absolutely. Um, and then your outcome is just simply pain, right? And you're hoping for reduced pain of some sort, somewhere along the line. All right. What is the research question? Put it all together. Let's so have a go. Start at the start. What the research question, Ray, would be sort of null hypothesis that whatever you do is not going to make any benefit. And then your job is to prove that that is wrong. We are constructing it using a PICO format. So we are asking, a, we are simply asking a, a question. We're not constructing a hypothesis at all. We're not providing this, this workshop isn't about directionality of all hypotheses. Right. It's more about asking a question. question. What do you want to know? Um, if you were doing a research project, um, depending on the type of research project, you might have a section of your, of your protocol or your manuscript that describes your hypothesis. So you want to know this, you reckon you're going to go and find that, right? And that, and you're going to find it in the direction of that. You're going to do that. 
but this one is more this this workshop is more about developing the question from a from a broader perspective focused but not not directional sandy what do you think the research question is um does keyhole arthroscopic surgery oh, i had a knee in there somewhere um impact pain levels more than exercise yep you could do that anybody else I had for women with knee osteoarthritis, does keyhole arthroscopic surgery rather than exercise with these pain levels? Yep. That would be following from the top down. Mm, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what I wrote too. It's like, you know, in women with knee OA, does keyhole arthroscopic surgery compared with exercise impact pain levels? You might yep. want to say reduce pain at that point in time. That's what I started rabbiting on with and then started getting confused. Much better, much simpler, Sandy. I like yours. And that, that's the thing. Start with your Pico and then make it grammatically correct for you. Tweak it if you need to. Do what you need to do. All right. Let's be Ruth's physiotherapist now. The GP's got the answer. They're all right. They're fine over there. Let's be Ruth's physiotherapist. At a recent conference, you saw a display of portable acoustic emissions analysis for examining knees with suspected osteoarthritis. You wonder how accurate this test is for making a diagnosis of knee osteoarthritis. Mm. Wow. Okay. Tricky words in there, but we don't have to worry about it. We just have to figure out what is the PICO in this? What is the population? the I, the index test, the comparator and the outcome. What is the PICO of this particular scenario? I'm going to say suspect, uh, knees with suspected osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's a great population. I just had people, people with osteoarthritis, but this maybe I need to say knees. <laughs> I think uh, it does need to be knees, but I think it needs to be suspected too. Because remember, she's this physiotherapist is interested in having a look at how best to figure out whether they have knee OA or not. So I suspected had, is a good word in there. I had suspected or slash um, considered OA diagnosis for knees. Okay. What's the I? What's the what's the index test that you want that to look at? Portable acoustic emissions analysis. Yep. What's the comparator? What do they already use? Perfect. That's right. What do they already use? Um, usually the gold standard what's their standard way of diagnosing it sorry i'll go there so what's the outcome then making a diagnosis or something along that lines uh oh yes. you're on mute oh no no caught up <laughs> yes yep so it would be a diagnosis of neo a right so what this physiotherapist is interested in doing is there is a standard way to diagnose knee OA in, in, in patients with suspected knee osteoarthritis, right? But she's heard that there's a new test to do it. So what she must do is compare the new test with the old test. So this person, this patient who comes to her with suspected knee OA must have the two tests, right? To see, um, we're assuming that what they currently do is best practice and, and gold standard and what they want to know is this is this other one as good right is it as good as the gold standard and sometimes it will be cheaper it might be um less time in this this time for the, the clinician and the patient and all that sort of stuff so it's important to know how to best most accurately diagnose stuff so this is this is um this is about whether one test is better than the other test so what's the research question then Using the P, the I, the C, and the O. What's your sentence?
All right, who's going to have a go? Go, Claire. Except you're on mute. <laughs> I think they call it, they say the first time you do it and then the second time's by choice. I'm sure that's about my 63rd today. Anywho, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. Uh, identify whether clients with suspected osteoarthritis in knees are able to be diagnosed using the portable acoustic emission analysis. Now, can you say the front bit again for me? I don't know about the first little bit of wording, but I was saying identify whether clients with suspected OA in knees I wasn't happy with it, but it's, I'm willing to uh, just go with that one to begin with. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? If I start at the top, if I start at the top of this one, I would go um, in, in people with suspected NEOA um, is portable acoustic emission analysis. Um, compared with a uh, standard test met, <laughs> uh, effective in or um, accurate rather in diagnosing knee osteoarthritis. And that too is clumsy, so you'd want to finesse that for a written sentence. Anybody else got something that's nicely worded? I struggled to even get past words. <laughs> Always just... start at the top. Well, then it was, that's what I was struggling with because I just had suspect, I just had those four dot points. I didn't have a sentence. I couldn't put it in a sentence. Mm. It was too, I was struggling. I was being too English grammatically correct. Yeah, don't, it. don't at the moment. Because usually sorry. if you start with, if you preface, sorry, Murdy, what was your comment? Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, pardon my indecency. I was just wondering that do you have to actually use accurate in your research mm -hmm. question? For example, say that portable acoustic uh, in, in people with suspected uh, osteoarthritis of knee, does portable acoustic emission analysis uh, is as accurate as standard diagnostic test? Now that means a different, when you compare accuracy of a test you're going down the path of uh, sens sensitivity, specificity, and pretty much, uh, you know, ROC, you know, the receiver operating characteristics of that particular test. Is it not? Mm -hmm. Or do you say that it is non-inferior to standard uh, standard testing. Okay, so, so two different things there. You've gone from the research question to so it, how you might analyze the data back yeah. to the research question. So we're not, I, I, I can very easily talk about sensitivity and um, specificity and receiver under the curve to um, analyses and all of that kerfuffle, but people here would go, mm, that's just too much. No, 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 not, not too much. I'm, because of the <laughs> accurate word that you have in your stem, if you want to, uh, sort of, I'm trying to frame the question that, that does a portable acoustic analysis is able to diagnose knee osteoarthritis, which is same as the information you get from a standard X-ray or an ultrasound, whatever you can call it, a standard plain X-ray features of osteoarthritis versus portable acoustic emission analysis. Mm -hmm. Do you, that accurate word takes it to a different dimension? Yes, it does. But that is indeed what you want to know because you want to know if you've got a gold standard test that, that the perception is that it is accurate in its diagnosis. Let's work on that framework, that your gold standard test is accurate in, define, in, in um, diagnosing a NEOA, you want to know if your new test is as accurate as that or better than that or worse than that. So the word accuracy, it is a broad word, but you will find that when you have a look at the literature and you'll go down that sensitivity specificity pathway. But it to in order to find um, some of the papers, some of the research papers that would 
um, speak to this problem, um, that would be that would be perfectly fine. And in fact, in a, in a search strategy, correct me if I'm wrong, Louisa, but you wouldn't use the word accurate. All right, mm. that would be a sentence that you might use in your protocol. But look, Louisa wouldn't use that in a in a search string. Um, right. She'd use the two tests and she'd use the problem. Is that fair? Start and you'd start off fairly broad as mm. well, and then you yep. would narrow down. Yes, you're right. Yeah. <coughs> but speaking to that, then I'm gonna I wanna I wanna test you a little bit more. Right, it's gonna stretch your limits just a little bit more with the next one. Okay. So therefore, now you know about PICO and you know about um, how to make it into a focused research question, what you really want to know about, what kind of health research question is it, right? So some people think that randomised control trials are the gold standard in health research, right? That's a myth. They are a gold standard. In, in research study designs, but only for a particular type of question, which is an intervention question, right? They are the gold standard if they're primary research, randomized controlled trials as primary research for inter intervention questions. But there are a whole heap of <coughs> other types of health questions where a randomized controlled trial would give you absolute, would make no sense whatsoever. And these are called the hierarchies of evidence, right? And so it's about figuring out where you might sit. Now, I'm not going to go into the hierarchies of evidence for you in this particular skill session. We can do that another time, right? What I want to do in this particular skill session is alert you to the different types of questions that you might want to ask. So now you know your PICO. And now you know how to make it into a research question. Let's think about what type of research question is, because that is going to help you develop a research program, a research, uh, a research study, and it will help you figure out, is this research paper that I found, is it the best one I should be able to find, or are there better ones for me to find? All right, so let's think about what types of questions there are. All right. So there's lots. All right. So let's have a look at it. Types of health research questions. If you want to know about what you should do about something, that's a treatment, that's an intervention question, right? And it's about whether or not you're evaluating the effectiveness of different things. You might be evaluating the effectiveness of different medications. You might be evaluating the effectiveness of a service. You might be evaluating the effectiveness of um, a particular um, group that you're running, Sandy, or surgical procedures, or the effectiveness of diet interventions, all of those kind of things where you are evaluating the effectiveness of something. How good is it? in treating X, they are intervention questions. And if we work through these in a way that, you know, um, I can show you different types, let's use the example of a common childhood um, health condition called acute otitis media, right, which is an ear infection. So if we were going to look at acute otitis media um, for an intervention question, you'd want to know um, whether antibiotics versus watchful waiting was more effective for acute otitis media, right? So that would be an example of how you would construct that. Like, you know, in children with acute otitis media, are antibiotics versus watchful waiting better at reducing pain? Let's, let's go there, right? That's an intervention question. But there are other kinds of questions. What if you want to know what caused a problem? right? What happened? These are etiology and risk factor questions, right? You want to find the origin or cause of a patient's condition. Now, if we use the example of acute otitis media again, you might want to know whether something like prematurity is a risk factor for acute otitis media in children, right? Is that a, because then you could be watchful for it. So if you had a client who was premature, all right, you might be watchful for symptoms of acute otitis media if they were more at risk doing that right that is an etiology question that's about what causes the problem is this is there something in there that increases the risk or might cause the problem 
Then there is something like what we just saw just then was does the person have this condition? That is a diagnostic question. And that's the one that we had the physiotherapy. And that was when Murdy was talking about sensitivity and specificity, right? It is a diagnostic question because you want to compare the accuracy and maybe even the safety, which I would argue is probably a good thing to look at, one of the diagnostic tests compared to what you're currently doing. So acute status media example would be how accurate is physical examination using otoscope compared with pneumatic otoscope for diagnosing acute um, otitis media, right? And then you might have what is, um, what, how, how do you get the condition or the problem, right? Um, what will happen? It's a prognosis question, right? What's going to happen? The essay that will tell us where the problem is. Sorry, Murdy, we can't hear you. I thought you were talking to someone in your office. Uh, one of the nurses who came with a patient issue. Sorry, I should have muted oh. it. Uh -huh. You were talking to someone in your office. No worries. Yeah, thanks. Right. Okay, so it's a prognostic question. So you want to know about how a health problem will progress to the likelihood of having some, something else happen. You know, um, using acute otitis media, how long does acute otitis media take to resolve if we don't prescribe antibiotics? Uh, what's, the, what's the natural prognosis? Now, how long can you expect for these parents to have sleepless nights because their children continue to have ear infections if you if you do watch for waiting? Then we've got frequency type questions. Who who's going to get? Uh, no. How common is the problem? Right. So how common is acute otitis media in childhood? That's a frequency question. How often does it happen? No. And a personal experience question. What are the experiences, concerns of something? And these are personal or phenomena kind of questions. And they are about exploring people's experiences and concerns. And so in a tutor titus media, right, you might want to look at what are the experiences of parents caring for kids with acute otitis media? You know, you might want to be asking them questions about, you know, are you tired? Uh, do you miss work? Um, what's your quality of life like during that period of time? Those kind of things. So you can see in health, these are the most common questions you can ask. And only one of them can be answered by an RCT. None of the others can. So RCTs are indeed a gold standard for um, study designs in health, only if it's an intervention question. In another workshop, skills-based session, we can tell you which type of questions, uh, which type of study designs are the best for which type of questions. But let's circle back then to what, whoops, to what we've worked on, right? So this is the last one we did, right? And we talked about, we said overall, it was about in women with knee OA, is arthroscopy or exercise more effective in reducing pain? It should be key arthroscopic surgery, beg your pardon. Um, is it more effective? In, so what type of research question might that be? I'll pop it back for you. What type of research question would your uh, key arthroscopic surgery versus exercise question be? I think it would be the top one. It's got intervention in it. <laughs> yep. Sandy, do you agree? Agree. Agreed. It's an intervention question. Claire, are you with me on that? Okay. All right. So let's do the next one. In women with NEOA, is portable acoustic emissions analysis better than gold standard to accurately diagnose NEOA? What type of health research question is this? I think it's still the first one. Others? I'm feeling obliged to say something else. <laughs> it, could be, it could be C as well because it's about diagnosis. But... I thought it was diagnosis to begin with and I'm like, oh, stop it. Is this like A, B or C? <laughs> All of the above. No, it's not. All of the above. It is a diagnostic question because you're comparing two 
tests to diagnose something, right? So you want to know a diag, this is a diagnostic question. And it may, it, it's important to know the type of question that you're asking because that will help drive either the study that you design or the articles that you look for, right? Um, so that's really important. You are not, if you want to know about um, the accuracy of a diagnosis, it's gonna, that knowing it's a diagnostic question should help drive you to figure out what's the best study design to answer that question. All right. Now, stress stretching you one bit further. Oh, ready? Just as the last bit, then you can go and have a cup of coffee or something because I hurt you. All right. Let's look at this. All right. Here is an experience or a phenomena question. All right. And the reason why I wanted to show you this, because I've taught you P, I, C, O, and sometimes T, right? The P, Co, P, Cot kind of principle. But depending on the research questions that I just showed you, you might not need all of the PICO elements, right? So let's try this one, all right? During 2020 and 2021 COVID outbreak, your service implemented the COVID in the home treatment service for remote communities. You're interested in understanding the participants, patients, caregivers, staff, perspectives on service delivery and care provision. All right. Write me the P code for this one, knowing that you won't need some of the elements because I kind of foregrounded that quite clearly for you. You won't need all of them. What will you need? Can you All not right. need more than one thing? <laughs> Sorry? Can you not need more than one thing? You will not need uh, two things. Yeah, fantastic. I think I'm winning. <laughs> Do tell us then. What is it? No, I think that um, I can figure out who the population is. Tell me who that is. Patients, caregivers and staff of the in-home treatment program. Who Agree. Like People okay with that? Yep, I'm okay with that. Yep. What else you got then? Do you yeah, what are you I, are you doing anything to them? No, I only had outcome. Perfect. You don't need an intervention because you're not doing anything to them. You haven't got a test to compare. You're not doing it. So therefore you don't need a comparator. What's your outcome? I need the thing again because I can't remember. <laughs> I don't need it now. Yeah. Um, perspective. No, it would be a qualitative survey, isn't it? Yeah. In the end, that that might be the device that we use to measure it. But I think if I'm just asking questions, it would mm -hmm. be the perspectives of service delivery and care provision. That's right. Yep. And how you do that, Murdy? Um, we haven't we haven't touched on how that would be study design things like that. How you did that? Uh -huh. All you right. could do a survey, but I'd probably prefer semi-structured interviews if I were you. If you were after this kind of information, surveys that, that people don't like to write, your surveys are, won't really get people's perspectives on things necessarily. Semi-structured so interviews. What would be the, the outcome in this particular instance? How, what do you define as an outcome? Sandy, you tell me what you said, because that, that was right. Their, their perspectives, the outcome is just gathering the data from them, what their perspective is of the service delivery and the care that they received. Yep. So that's it. Whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. It's just that's what their perspective was. Yes, exactly. Yep, exactly. Claire, you wanted to say something? <laughs> you guys are stars. Very cool. All right. Oh, I had to walk through that. All right. So the bottom line is, right, and, and Murdy struck on it there too. If you can... If you know what the PICO is, and particularly in that kind of question about your exploration of people's perspectives, if you know what your outcome is, you can help then structure how you're going to measure that. 
right? And it might be in a survey or it might be in semi-structured interviews. But if you know what you want to know, you then help um, figure out what it is you want to ask. A lot of people who do um, uh, experience or phenomena questions, a lot of people are interested in that, um, don't really put a lot of time into figuring out what it is that you want to know. Whereas if, you know, if I was going to measure depression, I'd probably use a DASH scale, right? And that's, oof, that's there. I know what I want to know. But these ones take a little bit more thought and care. Well, they all take thought and care. But you, I think people think that these kind of questions are easy. They're not. They're just as rigorous as all the others. You just have to be very mindful. Once you know what your outcome is in an experience phenomena kind of question, you then have to be really clear that in your, however you measure it, whether it be surveys, semi-structured interviews, you ask questions that elicit those kind of perspectives. So you don't just make stuff up. You really have to be very, very thoughtful about how you might get that information. Um, so the bottom line is no matter what questions you ask, what type of questions you ask in health, you will always, always, always need a P and an O, right? Some require a P and I and an O. Some require a P and I, C and an O, right? Some require a T over here, depends. But all of them must have a P and an O, okay? Um, so you can see that these skills, if you have these skills, you can now develop a clear research question, right? And this is the foundation of good research. You actually must know very clearly what it is you want to know. If you don't know clear stuff about what you know, it makes Louise's life very hard. It makes my life as a researcher very hard because I'm like, I don't know what it is. But if I, if I pick up a research paper and I cannot identify what someone's PICO is in the abstract, I'm already annoyed because if I can't figure out what your question is, neither could you. As a, as a researcher, and that's a bad thing. That's a very wasteful research project. So whenever you're writing proposals, grants, or anything like that, you need to make sure that you are very clear about what it is you want to know. And a peak <coughs> is purely an easy way for you to structure that. Do you guys have any other questions for me? No, Ray, I must thank you because... The reason I joined this was half the research is pretty much done if you have the right question, if you frame the research questions. Uh, you know, that takes away a lot of, many advanced trainees come to me because we have to supervise projects every mm. year. And often the difficulty is uh, framing the right research question because you can end up collecting data and analyzing it and then it becomes absolutely useless exercise. And it's unethical, right? Patients are giving up their time and their energy to participate in research because they feel like it's, it's, it's something that they should do to, 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 to better health, right? So it's unethical for you not to know what it is that you want to know. You shouldn't be collecting things that you don't want to know or you're not interested in. So I agree. You, I think that having a focused research question is an incredibly important way to start. The August skill session is going to be about the fundamentals of research study design <coughs> and that's going to be um, done by Michael Crow. all right so that's a, these sessions whether they be webinars or skill-based sessions are at the end the last Wednesday of every month one till two but TARC has an event calendar um, check it out look at it it's all good any other questions no thank you Ray it was great thank you Ray no all right, guys. Have a that great was afternoon. Awesome. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.